As an introduction to uh, the whole symposium of external fixator assisted uh, procedures, um, we need to just take a little step back in history to realize that the Elizroff method, the Elizroff fixator, really came into the West as a consequence of the Italians visiting, uh, visiting the uh, Siberian unit. And it was really in the early 80s uh, that the, the actual technique came over. And the method and the fixator has coexisted with many evolutions of techniques that have occurred since the 1980s. So the Italians, uh, much to the consternation of the original Elizarov people, started to add half pins to the fixator and term it, termed it as advanced Elizarov. It's just another form of fixation. And then subsequently, we obviously had the Americans introducing the hexapod as an alternative to building hinges and motors. And more recently, we've seen uh, internal fixation implants featuring more and more in deformity correction. Uh, custom uh, devices like lengthening nails, and there have been many evolutions of lengthening nails. Uh, and as this afternoon's symposium will uh, reveal to you, the use of internal fixation implants in conjunction with external fixators to achieve deformity correction. Now I'm going to present uh, on medial submuscular plating, which is a technique that uh, I've developed because of need. Uh, one of the presentations I will give later is about plating after lengthening, and I discovered during the evolution of my experience in plating regenerate after lengthening in the femur, it was that the, the plate uh, would occasionally fail when applied on the standard lateral surface of the femur. So it was a little research into looking at why did the plate fail when I used the plate on the lateral side that led me to understand that in those situations, it's the medial side that is advantageous for the plate. So my first slide really is to uh, explain why plating the medial side of the femur, which in your standard trauma training tells you it's the wrong side because it's the compression side, and your anatomical training will tell you horrifically you shouldn't be there because there are some big vessels uh, on that medial side. So let's just look at some simple plate biomechanics. Let's just take a femur that has a transverse fracture in the mid-shaft. And we know that you can summate the effective forces on weight bearing by using the mechanical axis as the resultant force that goes through the female weight bearing. And we all know from the last few days that there is a difference between the anatomical and the mechanical axis. And the mechanical axis represents that sum of forces that go through. So as a consequence of that, if we have a transverse fracture and we weight bear that unsupported transverse fracture, we have a bending moment created because of that obliquity of that mechanical axis. Right, that bending moment creates tensile forces on the lateral surface and correspondingly compression forces on the medial surface. So that's something that takes us back to early biomechanics. So if we apply a plate under compression on the tension side, we create a tension band. And what does that tension band simply does is when that tensile force is applied on weight bearing on the lateral surface, because of that compressive plate, it alters the forces across that fracture side to compression. Okay, so that's the tension band principle, and that's why we're taught by the uh, trauma courses, including the AO, about compression uh, tensile surfaces and compression plates. You need to remember some historical context to this. Compression plating was very much used when 
primary bone healing was the objective of internal fixation. And now primary bone healing has been relegated to even smaller and smaller areas in fracture healing. It, doesn't, it hasn't disappeared completely, but it's, it's relegated to a smaller role. So let's leave that for a moment and see what happens if we were to apply a compressive plate on the compression side. What would happen? Well, as you know, the oblique mechanical axis would subject this plate to compression. And as a consequence, you don't have that compressive effect across the fracture side. And that is why you're taught the right place to put a plate across the femur, if you have a transverse fracture, is on the tension side. If, however, you apply a plate on the medial side under compression, and because of the same effect, you get gapping on the lateral surface. So that is why in a transverse fracture, it's the wrong side to put the plate on the medial side. Now, I'm going to ask you to leave this and consider what happens when you have a defect. It's totally different if you have a defect or you have a medial cortex that is unsupported, a gap on the medial cortex. If you have the same mechanical axis, the same bending moments applied across that plate on the lateral surface, you cannot achieve that tension band principle. That tension band principle only works if there is contact across that side. So if you have a defect, that compression is not created across the regenerate. If, however, you place in a defect the plate on the compression side, what you benefit from is that you have resistance to the plate on the lateral side failing as a consequence of being exposed to bending stresses. Do you follow me? When you have bending stresses as a consequence of that oblique mechanical axis, in the presence of a defect, the plate on the lateral side will be subject to, to bending forces because there is no contact unlike that transverse fracture. So that plate will be subject to failure. Whereas if the plate is placed on the medial side in a defect, that doesn't happen because that plate is virtually in line with the mechanical axis, and it, it is not subject to bending forces. So, in situations of a defect, in situations of high comminution, where you cannot get the contact, there is a biomechanical advantage of placing the plate on the medial side. And this study that I've uh, referenced was published in the 1980s and almost forgotten in the literature. And it was in my research to understand why my plates were failing under, after lengthening when placed on the lateral side of the femur that I discovered this reference. And if you're interested, please have a read. Uh, they actually verified the, the, the thinking behind the biomechanics in the presence of a defect by doing an experiment on a dog. And you can see in the first image on the left-hand side, the plate is on the lateral side. And you can see that in the presence of a defect, that plate is being exposed to bending stresses and it's failing. Whereas the plate, the second plate on the right-hand image on the medial side is surviving. Simply put, if I can just simplify this whole thing to an analogy, you all know that if you have a defect or if you have an unstable fracture in the femur, you, you quote and are taught that an intramedullary nail is actually more stable and less likely to fatigue than a laterally placed plate, not because the intramedullary nail is closer to the anatomical axis, it's because that intramedullary nail is closer to the mechanical axis. So it's exposed to less bending stresses.
So if the intramedullary nail is better than a lateral plate, a medial plate is even better because it's in line with the mechanical axis. So that's the biomechanics. How do you put a medial plate in? So the surface landmarks, and this is a minimally invasive percutaneous osteosynthesis, so MIPO, is your surface landmarks are to use the origin of sartorius, the anterior inferior ilex spine, and the medial edge of the patella. That gives you an approximate line of the medial edge of rectus femoris. So draw that line out. To identify the two incisions, you can sometimes use an x-ray to delineate where the lesser trochanter is and about 10 centimeters distal to that lesser trochanter would be your first incision. And your second incision will be on the medial side of the femur over the femoral condyles. So you can also use surface markings of two finger breaths from the anterior inferior alex spine. Right. You can see here that I have wrapped the fixator in a uh, sterile swab that's usually soaked in some alcoholic chlorhexidine to, so that I can create not an aseptic feel, but at least uh, an antiseptic feel in terms of the fixator. And so that the operative feel is clapped away from the external fixator. When you've made the first incision, you need to recognize that you will, in your dissection, encounter some neurovascular structures. But the neurovascular structures you will encounter are not the femoral artery or the femoral vein, but branches of the lateral circumflex femoral artery. And I'll show that to you in a little while. Here you are. That is the structure that you need to be aware of you need to identify, and you need to mobilize. The descending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex is often accompanied by some branches of the femoral nerve feeding the vastus muscles. You will see them, and you need to dissect them and move them apart. Now, if orthopedic surgeons are unfamiliar in performing a dissection of a neurovascular bundle, to, dissect, to move it away safely, then consider you do this if you did a posterior approach to the humerus. So that skill should be within your grasp to do in the femur. If you do a posterior approach to the humerus, you would need to identify a nerve and a vessel and mobilize it out of the way. Same here. So there are three branches of the lateral femoral circumflex the descending, the transverse, and the ascending. You will only see the descending. You may see the transverse if you want to reach the lesser trochanter or even more proximal. But generally, you'll only see the descending. Right, so before you start the procedure and make your incision, the one thing you must do is, under x-ray control, back off your external fixator pins so that they are no more than flush with the medial cortex because you're planning to slide a plate along the medial surface of the femur. And so if these external fixator pins are still protruding beyond the medial cortex, they will interfere with the sliding of your plate. So before you start, just back them off a little bit so that they are just flush with the medial cortex. So here is the incision, skin incision, through fascia, reflect the fascia, keep the skin edges viable. You will see, you will look for the interval between rectus femoris and sartorius. How do you identify this interval? Simply by flexing the knee and see which muscle tightens up. Rectus will tighten, sartorius won't tighten. So that's one way. The other way is to look at the direction of the fibers. One is oblique and one is straight vertical. So there are two ways to identify that interval. Rectus femoris is often covered by its own envelope of fascia. 
the next step of the procedure is not to go down the interval between the two, but to identify the two muscles and then to open that separate envelope of rectus fascia, because that allows you to get into that envelope and retract the rectus muscle laterally, very safely. So you're well away from the neurovascular bundle. And that is the next step of the procedure. Open the fascia of rectus femoris, find the medial edge of rectus femoris, and retract rectus femoris laterally. Now, when you retract rectus femoris laterally, you will see the undersurface of the fascia because you've opened the fascia from the superior surface and you're now on the undersurface of the fascia. And through that fascia, you will see some nerves and a vessel. And that is the descending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex and some femoral nerve branches to the vasti. This step is where you need to, and this is a picture showing it a little bit more clearly, you can see some vessels descending with some nerves, so you open that fascial layer longitudinally. It's also important that when you open that layer longitudinally, I would palpate and identify where the femur is. So you can see that I've, uh, oh, it hasn't appeared yet. Uh, Sorry. There should be, yes, I think there is a superimposed shadow of the femur on the image. So palpate where the femur is because that can guide you which way to mobilize the artery and the vessels. If you find the anterior surface is a little bit more medial, then you would mobilize the descending branch and the nerves laterally. If you find the anterior surface of the femur is a little more lateral, then you would mobilize the artery and the, ves the nerves medially. So feel where the femur is, because you want to head to the top of the femur, the center of the femur. So by taking the vessels to one side, underneath the vessels will be vastus intermedius. Just split vastus intermedius, and you get to the anterior surface of the femur. That allows you to enter the safe plane, because once you're on the anterior surface of the femur, and this is extra periosteal, develop that plane medially, and now you are on the medial surface of the femur. So this approach is an approach to the anterior surface so that you enter the correct plane and then you develop the plane medially to get to the medial side. This then allows you to slide some scissors gradually along the medial surface, walk it along the medial surface and create a track following the line of the femur down probably to the distal two thirds of the femur. Obviously you can't get all the way to the bottom. And that's where you leave this approach and then go on to the distal side. So the surface markings, for those of you with me the other day on the dissecting room, are the width of the condyles and the mid shaft of the femur. So the middle of the width of the condyles to the mid shaft of the femur distally, you make an oblique incision. And that oblique incision will allow you to enter uh, Underneath the superficial fascia, the muscles beneath, which is vastus medialis. Distally, you need to identify the free edge of vastus medialis. That's a key uh, point in the dissection. When you identify the free edge of vastus medialis, sharply dissect that free edge and lift the vastus medialis anteriorly. That will expose the fibers of the vastus medialis coming from the medial intermuscular septum. Just keep separating the fibers as they come from the medial intermuscular septum, and that should allow you very nicely to get to the entire medial surface of the femur. You can use this same approach for applying a plate on the medial side of the femur as well. From this, you create a track. That track is along the medial side of the femur by blunt dissection 
to meet that track that you've created from the proximal incision. And that in itself is how you insert a plate along the medial surface of the femur. So the distal track and the proximal track meet halfway. They have both been created by walking along the medial side of the femur. And as you can see here in the image on the left, I'm sliding the plate in, putting my finger in so I can feel when the plate is coming up towards my finger and help guide it along the medial side. So the plate is positioned both distally and proximally and the screws are inserted under direct vision, not percutaneously. So through the two incisions, you insert the screws. And this is a radiological example. You can see the half pins have been uh, withdrawn so that they are flush with the medial <coughs> cortex. The plate is slid up and the screws inserted while the regenerate column, as you can see, is totally immature. So this can be done as soon as you finish the lengthening process. So here is a clinical example showing uh, the plate in situ. Is it safe? Have there been any anatomical studies to show that this is safe? Well, this is the reference uh, from Professor uh, Apeva Thakakul from Chiang Mai University. I demonstrated this approach to him while on my travels, and he actually had the facilities to do uh, cadaver studies and injection dye studies to confirm that this is actually a safe approach to slide a plate on the medial side. So, just to conclude, you might want to consider uh, this type of plating after lengthening. You might want to consider using a medial plate when there's a highly comminuted fracture to support a lateral plate. Uh, and I've also seen instances where you might want to use this in periprosthetic fractures where you have difficulty just using a long lateral plate to support the, the prosthesis and a second plate along the medial side will reduce the bending stresses that you get on that lateral plate. Thank you for your attention.